Uh, we are in the book of Daniel. And uh, we're in chapter 3. I'm calling the chapter Bower Burn. That's the choice that was presented to our young men. And uh, this is chapter 3 of Daniel. And just to review, so it's uh, not just for the newcomers that may have just joined, but also to really understand chapter 3, many people teach it without focusing on the fact that it follows chapter 2. It's a response to chapter 2 in a sense, in several senses of speaking. Um, you obviously realize uh, that we're studying Daniel for lots of reasons, not the least of which it has some of the most remarkable passages in the, in the entire Bible. And its climactic chapter, in my mind, happens to be the last four verses of Daniel 9, which we obviously will get to. But the reason it's so interesting to most of us as Gentiles, it's the, one of the rare places in the Bible that focuses on Gentile history. And uh, Daniel finds himself in a, the, a, a, at the headquarters of a uh, world empire that begins what Luke calls the times of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles go from Nebuchadnezzar until the Antichrist. So this is an important period. And this whole period, not just the history of Daniel, the whole period is in view prophetically in this book several times, three or four times actually. And uh, now, as I say, it has some of the most amazing passages. But the key thing that happened in chapter 1, of course, is Daniel, was, uh, he's, uh, he's of the royal family, as were several others, and they were deported by Nebuchadnezzar, partly as prizes or, or hostages, if you will, to make sure that the vassal king he left in charge would be loyal, but also because these youths were so promising, these are the cream of the crop, if you will, to train them for service at court. Nebuchadnezzar, had quite, he was quite a visionary. He realized it would be useful to have on a staff people that came out of and knew that culture uh, for lots of reasons. And uh, so that was, that's actually a very uh, interesting policy that he had. But Daniel and his three friends find themselves then transported several hundred miles away to a foreign culture. And in that, they try very hard to stay faithful to what they've been taught. They were obviously well taught by their parents, uh, very committed, and, uh, the, and, and, and men of prayer. So they're deported to Babylon. That leads to the uh, issue of Nebuchadnezzar's career. He was general of the army when he laid siege to Jerusalem, but... He finds his father's died. He's now king of Babylon. So he sets up the vassal king, goes home to take over the throne. And what we discover, or I should say what he discovers, that he's inherited from his dad these cronies that are his advisors. Four or five job classifications. We didn't we won't split hairs about that. But basically, the advisors, pagan advisors, deeply immersed in the occult that advise the king. And he's troubled one night with a dream that he instinctively knows is very important. So he not only wants it interpreted, but he also uses it as an opportunity to see if these guys are just going to bluff their way through or if they really have some kind of unique skill. So he insists that they tell him, they tell him what the dream was as well as the interpretation. And obviously they get unglued and can't do that. And that leads to him getting upset and laying out the decree that everyone was going to have uh, be wiped out. And Daniel is in that job description. And the dramatic story of Daniel 2, of course, was as Daniel, they go to prayer, God reveals it to him, Daniel comes forth, and there's this great scene in Daniel chapter 2 where Daniel comes forward and, uh, in, in, in the, before the throne and tells the king what his dream was, of course, which blows everybody away, especially the king, and then interprets it. And it turns out, indeed, its interpretation is very important to every one of us because it lays out all of Gentile history in advance. But the reason I review this isn't just for context. I want you to understand the setup here. These cronies that couldn't cut it, probably standing in the back row during this grandstand scene of Daniel, probably were very conflicted. Because on the one hand, they owed him his life, their life. If he hadn't pulled that off, they were, the decree had gone out. They were marked for death. So you imagine they would be grateful unless you really know human nature. No, they're not grateful, they're envious. They're going to get even with this young upstart and his gang. And so, uh, as you get into Daniel chapter 3, it has several things about it that flow right, it's actually about maybe uh, uh, some substantial time, it could be uh, a decade or so later. It isn't as if it happened next month. These are isolated episodes, but a, there is some interval of time, and scholars debate a little bit of how much time. I won't get into all that. That's not important to us. But uh, in any case, by the time you get to chapter 3, you can get the impression that the palace guard 
have gotten to the king, feeding his ego and setting up what they felt would be a sure revenge against these uh, Jewish intruders. So uh, well, I'll, I could call Daniel chapter 3 the revival's revenge, or attempted revenge, to be more precise. Another thing I call chapter 3, it's a symphony for sycophants. Because <laughs> we're going to get introduced to Nebuchadnezzar's ragtime band, okay? <laughs> Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and its breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. The plain of Dura is a, is a, a large region, obviously. It's all part of the, the uh, plain of Shinar, if you will. Now, this is interesting. This is quite a, a, um, a cubit, is, we assume for our purposes, about a foot and a half. Scholars will argue. There's estimates all the way from maybe uh, uh, 14 inches to 22 inches, uh, uh, but uh, the, the commonly accepted approximate, it, 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 you get into all kinds of technicalities. There's a royal cubit, there's an Egyptian cubit. A cubit was from the tip of the finger to the elbow, but that doesn't help much because how long was it from the tip of the finger? So, but if, for, for, as you read your Bible, you'll come across cubits all the time, and if you just visualize a foot and a half to get a feeling for it, you're close. This thing is 66 cubits high and six cubits at the base. And it's interesting, and here's just a rendering of a, a possibility of it on the screen, the, uh, and I've just assumed that it's probably very similar to the one that was in his dream. Now remember, this all probably is an echo, in a sense, of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, because remember, he was that head of gold. The dream had all the different metals, gold, silver, brass, iron. And, and, but you, Nebuchadnezzar, are the head of gold, Daniel told him. Well, see, apparently, Nebuchadnezzar has really gotten on an ego trip here. So he's made an image. I presume it's very similar to the one he saw in his dream, except there's one very substantial difference. It's all gold. There's no allusion here to a successor, as the, uh, as the dream did. You know, you're going to be succeeded in another, another, you know, the, the silver and then the brass and so forth. No, this is all gold. And to give you a feeling for this thing, not only is it all gold, uh, it's 60 cubits high. It's 10 feet higher than it is at the base. How it stands up, I don't know. But in any case, if I put a, a, a comparison there, a guy standing, this thing was apparently really tall. That little man at the base is, is a, a tenth of the height, so you get a feeling for it. Anyway, there's something interesting I found in some cuneiform tablets that apparently are in the British Museum. They record that there was a revolt in 580, 596 B.C. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar rose to power about 606, 605. And uh, it's, so in other words, it's within a decade, there was a revolt in his, in his uh, empire that he obviously put down. But that may have set the stage for a whole-scale reaffirmation and swearing allegiance in the support of Nebuchadnezzar. It's possible that this event we read about in chapter 3 was Rebbe Knezzar's response, having put down this rebellion, to get people to sign up. You follow me? And, and I personally suspect, though, a large measure of his particular tactic here was fed to him by Daniel's rivals because they take advantage of something they knew about these young Jewish men. They knew, being Jewish, they would not bow down before an idol. And the fact that the Nebuchadnezzar is on this ego kick, uh, I suspect he was fed by these guys because what happens here in chapter, verse 2, then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of, his image, of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Big deal. Very formal. But he goes on. This gets, this gets tough. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, and the sheriffs, and the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages. By the way, notice the plural of nations. This is not just a city-state. Babylon was the capital. But by this time, it was the dominant power in that region. And there were subsets of all kinds that were beholden to and ruled by Nebuchadnezzar. You need to understand, he was quite a despot. 
Anyway, the herald says, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. So that's the call. When the music plays, you're to bow down. That's the word. And whoso, now here's the, here's the, here's the, uh, <laughs> the, he explains it a little more clearly here. Whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. We know from uh, archaeological excavations and so forth, it was not uncommon. They have very large furnaces for brick making, for melting metal. This was, uh, this was probably the leading edge of their technology in some respects. But in any case, they're also, they also, there are records where they used them also for uh, punishment and for execution. And that's what we're dealing with here. So Nebuchadnezzar is serious. Somehow they fanned his ego that he's not only made this thing, he's requiring his subjects to worship the image. So we're down to verse 7. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshiped the golden image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. But here, up till now, that's, that's all just the setup here. Here comes the key bit here, verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Now, remember I told you last time, the term Chaldean can be a ge geographic term. They're all, in Cal they're all uh, ethnic in the sense of being a, uh, of that background. But the term is also used in a sense of uh, a job description, of an uh, occultic advisor. And uh, so these, this is a, it can be treated here in a sense a synonym for those, those five categories of advisors that we went through last time. It's a, it, that one is used as a generic for the rest of them. Where for that time certain Chaldeans, certain members of the staff, these are guys probably that were standing in the back row when the young Jewish uh, entourage shamed them. Saved their life, yes, but also embarrassed them because they had the answer and these guys didn't. So they came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Which is just a, you know oriental greeting. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down or worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a fiery furnace. They're repeating the, the thing quite thoroughly. They, in effect, are reminding him of what he said, which causes me to conclude he probably said it because they told him to. They probably drafted his announcement. But they call his attention to the fact, this is what you required. Then they come to their punchline. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. See, I think that's the whole point. They set this up to have a basis to accuse these guys. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Now, you know, that surprises me. What do you infer from verse 13? He'd already put out the word that if somebody's not bowing down, that same hour he's going to be thrown in the furnace. He's not doing it here, is he? See, this reminds me a bit of Joseph in Egypt. Do you remember when Potiphar's wife accused Joseph of trying to attack her? And Potiphar threw, threw uh, Joseph in prison? You know what that tells me? Potiphar knew he, she was lying. Because if he, re, if he believed Joseph had, had taken advantage of his wife, he would have had him put to death. He was the chief executioner anyway. The fact that he, did, he had to do something to save face, because he can't prove it, but I have to believe that he didn't really believe her. You follow me? Just a personal impression. And uh, I have the same kind of a thought here. I think Nebuchadnezzar was anxious to give these guys a second chance. 
I think he ha they had favor with him. He's upset because they're not doing what he commanded, but he's giving them a second chance. And I think that's not, that if I understand the guy, that's not his normal manner. Off with his head is his usual approach, right? So Nebuchadnezzar, his rage and fury, commanded, bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, using obviously the Babylonian names here. And they brought these men before the king. Now, Shadrach, is, of course, is the Babylonian name. It means something like illumined by the sun god. His real name was Hananiah, beloved of the Lord. And we went through this before. Remember, Meshach is, means who is like the moon god. Michelle is who is God. See, they had Hebrew names that, that extolled the god of Israel. But the Babylonians, to, to start breaking them away from their cultural background, gave them Babylonian names that involved Babylonian gods. And uh, Azariah was called Abednego, servant of Nego, or shining fire. When his, 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 he was named Lord is my help. And so that's their name. Well, here's what's kind of interesting. This is what, there is a Babylonian clay prism that's presently the, in the Istanbul Museum today that lists three people from this period. One is Hanunu, chief of the royal merchants, a very, which is apparently a variation of Hananiah or Shadrach. Uh, Mushal er, uh, Marduk is one listed there. If you drop the Marduk part, which is the name of one of their gods, it's Meshach. And uh, Ardi Nabu, secretary of the crown prince, is an alternate form for Abednego. So we can't be sure, but many scholars suspect that the, these, you know, in the, in, in the uh, translation and so forth, this, this clay prism may be an allusion to these three guys. Can't prove it, but it sure sounds like it. It's awfully close if you understand the, the alternate forms of the, of, the, of the Aramaic and so on. Anyway, let's move on. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? He's, he's, this is, now notice he's, he's giving them, in effect, a, a chance to make a declaration. He, says, now he, he goes on and says, Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, Ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast in the same hour, in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Well, you're going to find out, buddy. <laughs> I love Shadrach. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, I love these guys, these are great. O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful or cautious might be a better word. We're not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. The Missler translation is, up yours, O king. <laughs> Well, you know the story. You know what's coming, of course. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and form, the form of his visage was changed again. Now, see, that tells me something else. This is where he's really angry. See, up till now, I think he was on their side, sort of, trying to get them off this thing. But see, here it says, his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. He's upset. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. That was a big mistake. Because what happened to those guys? Not the, not the Jewish guys. They got it, yeah. Then these men were bound in their coats, their, their hosen and their hats, their turbans, whatever, and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We just found out they were his best, right? Nebuchadnezzar lost his best soldiers. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fire furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished. And he rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? He answered and said, O king, true, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. 
And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Who do you think joined them in the fire? Huh? Jesus Christ. I do too. Now you'll find, I should, I should be uh, uh, forthright with you here. Um, what the Aramaic says is the son of the gods. It's not Elohim, the Hebrew. It's Elohim in the he Aramaic. And, and it, you, if you translate that naively, it sounds like he's like a, someone there like the son of the gods. But you see, you've got to overlay on this a very interesting discovery about Hebrew and the word God. When you get to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, Barashit bara Elohim, in the beginning God, but the word is Elohim. Now most of you, even though you don't know Hebrew, you know enough about Hebrew to know that's an I am ending is a plural. You have a cherub, cherubim is more than one, right? Uh, you have seraph, seraphim is more than one. Certain class of Hebrew nouns, when you have an I am end, what we would call an I am ending, means it's a plural. The word Elohim in the Hebrew is a plural noun. But what's bizarre about the Old Testament is the word Elohim is always used as if it was singular. You know how language is, not English so much, but most language, if you have any foreign language, you know, you, your, your noun, your subject has to agree with a verb. If it's a singular subject, you have a singular, you have, ver, verb forms have to match. And, uh, uh, but in the Hebrew, Every time you see the word Elohim as a grammatical error because the verb treats it as if it was singular. And they say, gee, wait, wait, what's that all going to It's a subtle testimony in the first few verses of the Bible of the Trinity. See, you and I, everybody has trouble with the Trinity. We, have, uh, we, we can't visualize plurality and unity together. We always think plurality and unity are opposites. No, you can have plurality and if it has perfect, it's still have perfect unity. The clumsy analogy I often draw, like in business, it's like you have a corporation of three guys. Legally, it's an entity, but the three guys are perfectly in harmony. They're not having a dispute. It's still a plurality, but it's a singular ent entity. It's, it's one God and three. And uh, you can find, by the way, I don't want to get into all this too far off the track here, but an uh, interesting study is to study the Trinity in the Old Testament. The Trinity is all through the Old Testament. Holy, holy, holy. It's always three. And, uh, and they even talk among themselves. And Psalm 2 is a discussion between among the three members of the Trinity. Uh, Psalm 2. Check it out. Anyway, so the point is, um, this is not the same term that you find in the Bible where it says, Bara Elohim, which are the sons of God in the, sense, in the created sense. That's the use of angels. This happens to be in the Aramaic. But it's a construction as close in the Aramaic as you get to to, the, to the, the, the Hebrew structure, you follow me? And so uh, 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 the fourth is like the Son of God. And uh, so um, what's interesting, too, to realize the fire didn't hurt them, but it sure got rid of their, their, bond, their bounds. They were thrown bound in there. They're now walking around loose. But we'll notice the next verse. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants, get this, of the Most High God, this is Nebuchadnezzar acknowledging that he's been upstaged by the real God. And by the way, just to give you a preview ahead, chapter 4, the next chapter in Daniel was written by Nebuchadnezzar. And it's a humiliating testimony of his lesson in pride that concludes by his acknowledging that God is God. But in any case, we're getting ahead of ourselves. But here, you can already start to see the thing happening. Ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of fire. It doesn't say, I mean, it never came, <laughs> it doesn't say that he asked, where's the fourth guy? What happened to him? He seems to have gone. Okay, whatever. And the princes, the governors, the captains, the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. We did a uh, CBS special some years ago. Uh, I was asked to be part of it, and, and, uh, but they also had an expert from Al Corning on, on furnaces. And he talked about the different kinds of furnaces they found in the Middle East. So 
but he speculated that one way is that this might have been a cold spot. You know, sometimes you can have a backfire, a backdraft, or you know, there's a spot. They apparently found a spot where it wasn't hot. That was his, you know, suggestion, which means he didn't get the message. You know, so. Uh, I mean, I didn't want to, you know, in, in the context of the, the, the special, I didn't press it, but, but uh, that's, <laughs> that this implies that there's no cold spot here. Anyway, then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel, or his messenger, if you will, and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own. This is Nebuchadnezzar explaining the whole lesson here for you, to you and me. Is that the, they, they gave their lives that they might not violate God's law. That they might not serve nor worship any god except their own. Wow, that's great. Now, he calls him an angel here. Now, you know, there's some, there's some scholars who say, well, that probably was an angel, and, and, and I'm not going to argue with that. I personally believe it was an Old Testament parent of Jesus Christ. And that has a technical term. It's called a theophany. And several times in the Old Testament, it's very clear it is Jesus Christ. I'll give you one example, and that's the, uh, chapter 5 of Joshua. Just before the Battle of Jericho, Joshua, I visualize him walking after dinner, and he encounters a, 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 a man with a sword in his hand. And Joshua challenges him like a sentry. Are you for us, our enemies? And the person he's encountering says, take off your shoes, you're on hallowed ground. Now Joshua would remember that some years ago, 40 years ago, at Sinai, that's what God said to Moses, take off your shoes. So I, I, I think Joshua would have connected that, right? And furthermore, he allows himself to be worshipped. That tells me he's not an angel. It's Jesus Christ. Who fought the Battle of Jericho despite the musical? No, it's Joshua. And uh, uh, so, uh, you'll, uh, and if you study the book of Joshua, you'll discover it models the book of Revelation in structure, where another Yehoshua dispossesses what he purchased from the usurpers. There it was a land of Canaan. Next time it's going to be the planet Earth. You know, it's, the, it's the closing of the escrow that he paid for on the cross. Let's move on. Uh, verse 29, therefore, there's Nebuchadnezzar continuing here. Therefore, I make a decree. This is the king of the world at that time. I, therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill. Because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Was Nebuchadnezzar impressed? <laughs> you bet. You know, it's easy for us to sort of see, look here, critical, and say, of course. He saw, you know, it's still a big step for a guy to admit he's wrong, not try to rationalize it. Well, they must have run into a cold spot or something. <laughs> Last verse of the chapter. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the province of Babylon. So, um, now, that ends the chapter. We've got a little short chapter here. We've got a little time left over, which means we could go on or we could maybe make sure we got all the lessons here. You know, it's often interesting when you read your Bible to not only pay attention to what's there, but be sensitized to what's not there. What's missing from chapter 3? Daniel. Daniel, right on. That is a big mystery. He's not mentioned. So we'll explore that a little bit. Now, we're going to get into something as we do that. Before we get into that, I want to highlight something else. We're going to make a little appendix to our lesson today. I'm going to call it advanced hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the, is the, uh, the, the study of interpretation of Scripture. And as you know, if you, t if you take the scripture seriously, you believe God means what he says and says what he means. And, but don't fall in the trap of saying, well, we take it literally, because all that will do is get your antagonist to say, well, then you don't understand figures of speech. To which you say, yes, I do. God uses figures of speech. And your authority is Hosea chapter 12, verse 10, where God says, I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions, 
and used similitudes. Similitudes is a, is a figure of speech. Now, it may interest you to know that there are figures of speech in the Bible. A simile, that's a resemblance. You find that in Genesis 25, Matthew 7. I won't go through each one of these. You also have allegories. That's a comparison by representation. And you also have metaphors. That's another form of representation. These similes, allegories, and metaphors have some technical differences. We won't split hairs here. There's also a very commonly used term, if you read biblical literature, called a type. It's used in the same sense that we use the word prototype in an engineering. A prototype has an antitype. A type is typically a model of something. Uh, in a literary sense, it's a figure or an example of something future in the, in the biblical sense. But um, if, you ha if you build a house that's just a one-story house, you, you, a, a floor plan is usually enough. But if you do a split level or something that's a little more complicated in three dimensions, typ typically your architect will build a model of it to scale so you can get a feeling for the use of space and so forth. You make a model of the house. If you're designing an aircraft, you'll make a mathematical model of the wing to see how it's going to deal under different kinds of stresses. We make models all the time, the term model in our life, because everybody in any kind of technology uses models of all kinds. The, 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 the literary equivalent of that is the word type, but, and you'll come across that a lot. But also, there's a thing called an analogy. That's a resemblance in some particulars. And one of the dangers of an analogy is we often, an analogy is usually good for a particular aspect. It doesn't mean you can apply it to everything. I've given you here five different kinds of figures of speech. I've spared you the technical definitions, and when I go down, the, uh, do you know how many different kinds of speech I have in a catalog of these? In our book, Cosmic Codes, Appendix A, is a catalog of figures of speech in the Bible. How many different kinds do you think there are? Over 200 different kinds. Your catalog there, there are there's verses that give you examples and so forth. Uh, this is a study that is neglected today. We don't study rhetoric that thoroughly. But there's also hypocatastasis, which is an implied resemblance. There's all kinds. Anyway, there's several hundred of these. So anyway, I uh, want to give you a snapshot of what's probably the classic case of a type. And we, uh, just a quick re snapshot review of Genesis 22. You all know the story about Abraham offering Isaac. Uh, it, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, he said, here, behold, here I am. He said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. This is a very interesting verse for several reasons. How many sons did Abraham have? Too, but as far as God, he had one from faith. That was Isaac. It's also, there's an interesting thing you might want to mark your word if you have your Bible in, at this place. See the word, whom thou lovest? You might mark that because that's the first place the word love appears in the Bible. And there's also something else you'll learn as you study your Bible. There's a thing they call the law of first mention. Almost every concept you encounter in the Bible, the place it first shows up is usually fundamentally significant. And it's interesting here that this echoes John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that links it. That links this historical event with a future fulfillment. But anyway, um, by the time you get to this time in Abram's life, he, 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 the next morning he does exactly what God said. Abram rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men. Notice there's now four people. Abram, his son, and two young men. And... Uh, with him and Isaac's son, and they clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place where, which God had told them. So they traveled from Beersheba, which is where they were living, a three day journey up to that region which today is Jerusalem. In those days, it was a Jebusite city called Salem. That is, the southern part of it was. We'll get to that in a minute. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his hands, his eyes, and saw the place afar so off. Now, from the Obviously, Abraham was going to offer his son Isaac. If you know your scripture and you understand the Jewish mind, when did Isaac die as far as Abraham's concerned? When he got the commandment. He's as good as dead is the point, the way we'd say it. 
at the, after these three days, they get up there. What ultimately happens? Isaac is returned to him, isn't he? How long was Isaac dead to Abraham? Three days. And you say, gee, check, that's contrived. No, the scripture endorses that in the New Testament. Galatians 3, Romans 4, and, and, uh, and uh, 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 Hebrews 11. We'll get to that part of that in a minute. Anyway, so Abraham said to his young man, you guys stay here. See, they're at the bottom of the hill. You two guys stay here with the donkey. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. He's either stalling them or expecting that after he kills Isaac, God's going to res resurrect him. The one thing you need to understand is that Abraham knew that Isaac would be resurrected. How did he know that? Because God had promised him that Isaac would have children. So, you, God, you want me to kill him? You've got a problem. I don't have a problem. You've got a problem. That's his attitude. It really is. And we'll come back to that. But anyway, he said, I'm the lad, we'll uh, come back to you. Abraham took the wood of burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac, his son. Who's carrying the wood up the hill? Isaac. He took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they both of them went together. Technically, in Hebrew, they went in agreement. We will come again to you. Okay. Isaac spake unto Abraham's father, and he said, My father, he said, Here am I. He said, My son, he said, Behold the fire in the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went both together. I read this for many, many years, assuming that Abraham was just giving the kid a stall. See, I also, like most of us, were victims of our little Sunday school coloring books. I always visualized the kid may be 12 years old. Scholars suspect he's about 30. And, uh, and notice what Abraham says. God will provide who? Himself. A lamb. Who's going to be the lamb? God will be. So they went both of them together. I believe, for lots of reasons, that Abraham... He was serious about killing him and offering him. Don't misunderstand me. But Abraham knew he was acting out prophecy because he names the place Jehovah Jireh. That is, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. He gives it a prophetic name when he's finished. Let's move on. God will provide himself a lamb. Okay. They came to the place which God told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac's son and laid him on the altar, uh, on the, up on the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. He's ready to do it. He's going to redo this. He's not, playing, he's not playing games here. Here's the setup. Here's a topo map of that region. There's a, Mount Moriah is a ridge system. Starts about 600 meters above sea level and gradually rises through a saddleback and finally up to about 777 meters above sea level. It is surrounded uh, by uh, a mountain to the west called Mount Zion. It was separated by a Teropian Valley, which in the meantime has filled in. And Mount Zion has become generic for the general region, of course, but it actually was the, the mountain to the west originally. And uh, to the east was the Mount of Olives, separated from the ridge by the Kidron Valley. There's another valley along the south, the Hinnom Valley, which becomes a dump too, and that's where you get the term Gehenna and all that. But anyway, um, my premise here is that Abraham is climbing the ridge system, but I don't think he did it. The, I don't think he offered Isaac at the bottom of the hill. Why? Because it was a settlement called Salem in those days. We got introduced to that um, uh, chapter 14. Uh, eight chapters earlier, Mel, uh, Melchizedek is the, is the honcho down there. We're in chapter 22 at this point. No, I think he went north, the hill above the town. Keep going up north. As you get up to 741 meters above sea level, there's a saddleback that later on becomes the thrashing floor that David buys from Aruna and becomes the side of the temple. It's not there yet, though. That's all future. He keeps going to get to the peak, I believe. The bottom is Salem, or Ophel, we call it later. The thrashing floor of Aruna is where the temple is built, but it, the offering is not at the temple, despite that's the Hebrew tradition that he's a. He went to the peak. And if you go to the peak and look at it more closely, it's a place called Golgotha, a place of the skull. Here's the point. Abraham offered Isaac, probably not realizing that 2,000 years later on that exact spot, another father would offer his son. So that's kind of neat. Now, this is what, um, of course, the angel interrupts him and, and he tells him to, uh, uh, they, they substitute. It's in Romans 8.32, it says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for his all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That alludes to this, of course. It's interesting that in Leviticus, um, 
111, one of the requirements, when you study Leviticus, you'll say shall the high priest shall kill it on the side of the altar northward before the Lord and the priest, Aaron's son, shall sprinkle his blood around. Even in the Levitical things, it's north outside the camp. This was north, just outside the city. Interesting. Northward. Abraham lifted up his eyes, looked behind him, saw a ram. They substitute the ram. And interesting, in verse 14, he says, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. See, it's a prophetic name. Now, and it's interesting, when you get to Hebrews 11, we know that by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. He that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. According, notice this is, here's the key belief that Abraham had clung to. Accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham received Christ in the type of believing in Isaac's resurrection. Get the picture? Okay. Revelation gives us the climax, of course, where it says, when John says, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven or earth, were, neither, no man in heaven or in the earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. It says, John says, I sobbed convulsively, is what it actually says. I sobbed much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither look thereon. That's the generic, but fortunately there's an exception because one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seal, seven seals thereof. And John says, I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood the lion of the tribe of Judah, that's somebody calls him here. The lamb as it had been slain. Still has the nail prints. Still has the wound in the side. The lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and ten, uh, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth on all the earth. And it goes on. Got that. This is the climactic scene where the lamb that was given on the cross is taking possession of that which he purchased. All that's foreshadowed 2,000 years earlier by Abraham's Follow through with what God told him to do. The lamb as it had been slain. Well, let's get back here, if I may, to um, Genesis 22 for a minute. The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham and out of uh, heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, because, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I'll multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as at the sand which is above the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth, not just Israel, all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men. They rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. I'm going to come back to this verse in a minute. But let's, uh, we're talking typology here. Abraham is a type of what? The father. And Isaac is a type of the son as an offering. He's the only son, and it's the first mention of love, as I mentioned. He's dead to Abram three days, intriguingly enough, and that's what was counted to him as a figure. And by the way, Paul de uh, uh, defines the gospel as how Christ uh, was, uh, died for our sins, was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And you're hard-pressed to find where in the scriptures does it say he's going to raise on the third day. Well, you say, Jonah, that was one thing. But this is the other place, by the way, another place. But when you get to chapter 24, a couple chapters later, we have another interesting event, and I won't go through this in detail because we don't, you don't want to spend the time on it here, but, but um, Abraham commissions his business partner to get a bride for Isaac. And uh, his, his, his business partner is a guy by the name of Eliezer. And Eliezer would have inherited his estate if he hadn't had issue. He's not just a, he's a servant, yes, but don't, that, that's misleading. He's like a, like a business partner. Anyway, to gather a bride for Isaac. Isaac makes the trip back to the, their home country, runs into the gal by the well. You know the story. She qualifies her with some questions at the well. She agrees to marry this guy she's never seen. He goes to the family and says, he gives her gifts as they return. And she eventually, when she gets back to the land, she encounters for the first time the bridegroom at the well of Lahai Roy. 
That's what really all happens in some 60 verses of chapter 24. Now, what's going on here? Well, Abraham, again, is in the type of the father. Isaac is the son for whom the bride is gathered. Eliezer is in the role of the Holy Spirit, out to gather a bride for Isaac. By the way, it's interesting, you cannot tell from chapter 24 of Genesis what the servant's name is. You have to go back to chapter, uh, earlier chapter, 15 I think it is, to discover that, that, that his, the servant's name is Eliezer. Do you know what the Eliezer means? Comforter. Comforter. Isn't that interesting? It even goes further than that. Every time in the scripture that there is a person that in the type is the Holy Spirit, he's always an unnamed servant. Here in chapter 24, he plays the role of an unnamed servant. We know what his name is because we can find it out elsewhere. When Ruth, in the book of Ruth, is introduced to Boaz, the kins who, come, who ends up being the kinsman redeemer, who introduces Ruth to Boaz? Not Naomi. No, an unnamed servant. The Holy Spirit always positions himself invisibly because of John 16, 13. Jesus said to his disciples, he will never testify of himself. I'm fascinated by this, not just because of the theology of it, the precision and the integrity of it, the little subtleties, whether it's Genesis or the book of Ruth and the, during the period of the Judges, or whether it's John's, the discourse in John 16. The consistency of design tells you that there's a single author. Follow me? But we're gonna, it, gets, it gets better. Let's go back to Genesis 22, verse 19. Remember, Abram's up on, the, up on the hill. They're about ready to go home. In verse 19, it says, Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abram dwelt to Beersheba. And the question I ask here is, anyone asked before, where's Isaac? Obviously, as we read this narrative, we take for granted that Abram, Isaac, and the two guys all went home, a three-day journey back to Beersheba. But that's not what it says. Abraham returned unto his young men, these two guys down at the bottom of the hill, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abram dwelt at Beersheba. What fascinates me here, if you examine your biblical text, you'll discover the person of Isaac is out of the record from the time that he's offered until he's united with his bride. In chapter 24, verse 62. And what fascinates me about this, I, 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 what I see here is the Holy Spirit hovering over this, nudging the text, not to make it untrue, but by not mentioning Isaac here, it fits the model. You see, you follow me? From the time he's offered until he's united with his church, he's not visible here. He's invisible. And uh, he's alluded to in the period, but he, he, he disappeared. Anyway, so that's, so where's Isaac? So that's, uh, he's personally edited out of the record until he's united with his bride at Lahai Roy. Two chapters later, the well of Lahai Roy by means the well of the living one who sees me. The word, the word means. The, this whole thing is to show you it's, the, it's integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And of course, the marriage model, we could spend a lot of time on that. But it's interesting that there are a number of Gentile brides in the Old Testament. Eve, you could call a Gentile. You know. uh, Rebecca, Asenath, Joseph's wife in, in Egypt. Moses married Zipporah. Uh, Salmon married Rahab, the harlot, and their son was Boaz, interesting, and both bears Ruth. What's fascinating, in each of the Gentile brides in the type, you'll find none of them have a death recorded. I think that's interesting. I'm not saying he didn't die, I don't understand. But as far as the record's concerned, see, the type isn't violated by having them die. Interesting. Well, let's go back to, let's take another look at Daniel 3. All this was just a little by road for us to go back now with this kind of perspective. And let's look at chapter 3 in a revisit. And the rabbis have a term, they call certain things a remez, which is a hint of something deeper. A remez is like a little signpost, a little hint to look more carefully. A remez. Let's compare Daniel 3 with Revelation 13. Revelation 13, the, the, the ruler of the world in Revelation forces the world to worship his image. There's something familiar here? 
Is that a replay of Nebuchadnezzar's ego trip? Is Nebuchadnezzar, in some sense at least, a type of the Antichrist? Some scholars think so. Or Babel and Nimrod, same thing. Also, there's a single enforced religion, Revelation 17, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. The mark of the beast. I could be cute here and say Daniel's going to miss the mark of the beast in, Dan in the lion's den, but that's, we're getting ahead of ourselves. But in Revelation, this forced worship is, uh, is, is suggested by marks of some kind. That's where people uh, speculate there might be barcodes or microchips. We get into all that stuff. And what it is is Satan's analogy of the seal of the Holy Spirit. In, in Ezekiel 9, verse 4, and also uh, in Ephesians elsewhere, you and I are sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's not a visible seal. It's a seal of the Holy Spirit. But this is Satan's seal. If you take Satan's seal in Revelation 13, it's a forever barrier to being saved. But you and I don't have to worry about that. That's post-rapture. The um, fiery furnace in Isaiah 43 and, and Daniel 9 elsewhere, the, 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 the fi a fire is used as an idiom of the tribulation. Well, if that's true, uh, and it's interesting that the men were destroyed by flames, the other guys were, who are these three youths? Who do they represent? Well, some scholars see maybe they represent the 144,000. They're in the tribulation, but they're miraculously preserved through it. That's the analogy. So Nebuchadnezzar is viewed by some as a type of the Antichrist, forcing the world to worship his image. Um, the fiery furnace is, is, is analogous in some sense to the tribulation, perhaps. And if, that's, if that fits, then the three U's, that are the, the Jewish young men, are representative of, if you will, the 144,000. And it's in that spirit, then, if that is valid, that you have to either feel that way it is or it isn't, it's no big deal. But then that raises the question, where's Daniel? Well, fi the fire, by the way, is an idiom, something you can study in, in, as a separate thing. Fire is used as a symbol of God's presence, as God's pathway, his precepts, his punishment, his power, and his protection. And, of course, in prophecy. And the notes that accompany these tapes will have all these. You can you make, make, do a little study of fire in the scripture if you want to. But uh, the real missing element here is where's Daniel? And Daniel is conspicuous by not being present in chapter 3. So why wasn't he there? Well, there's three possibilities. First, maybe Daniel yielded to the king's. He wasn't accused because he yielded. Maybe Daniel, you see Daniel bowing before this thing? I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, maybe Daniel didn't bow, but he seemed to be exempted from accusation by his enemies. <laughs> I don't think so. They would love to be able to have Daniel in there with them, right? The enemy, enemies would have. And of course, there's a third possibility, and that's what Daniel had been removed from the situation. In practical terms, historical terms, I, I, he was prime minister. I assume he was out of the country on an errand for the king. In fact, that's what probably gave rise to the whole plot. Because Daniel's gone, and so these guys hatched this thing to get the king on this ego trip in order to trap these three J Jewish guys into a situation that would get them out of the way. That makes sense to me. The fact that Daniel isn't there is it was part of their opportunity. And uh, so I assume he's been on a substantial, and travel in those days was you know, extended stuff. It took longer. So you know, who knows? We have no, we, there's, the, the scripture's silent about this. From a typological point of view, the fact that Daniel's not there is extremely provocative because many people, you can't, these aren't proofs, these aren't things you build doctrine on, but many people see Daniel as a type of the, the, the believers. And, and, uh, uh, and so... Again, though, we have one. New Testament is Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is the New Testament revealed. Well, we have a session coming up called Chapter 4. And what I'd like you to do for next time is to read Chapter 4 as a lesson in pride. And take note of the fact that it was written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. He actually writes the chapter, and he doesn't put it away in the library. He has it posted throughout the world. I visualize guys riding on a horseback up to a tree and nailing this thing for all to read. It's testimony time, fascinating time. And, and, and if you have extra time, I encourage you to go ahead and read chapter 5 because we've got a big one coming up, a major milestone uh, time after next, which will be chapter 5, the fall of Babylon. 
There's a lot there, and we have a lot of visibility of that. But you also, when you read chapter 4, you need to understand, I, might, I may not be right, this is just a conjecture on my part, but I will not be surprised if I see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. I would not be surprised to find him in heaven. And we shall see. We'll learn a lot about he and Daniel that may touch your heart in the next chapter. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Daniel, what a fascinating career he had. Faithful young man that stood by his guns, stayed faithful to the Lord, and has the most spectacular career in history. He rises to power in the world empire twice. When that empire gets taken over by the Persians, he rises to power there again. He has, he has one of the most incredible careers you can, can imagine. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun book. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just thank you for the record of Daniel. We thank you for this faithful man. I thank you, Father, for the lessons that you've put here for our learning. We do pray, Father, that you would give us the insight, but above all, the resolve to be faithful. We thank you, Father, for this incredible young man. And we thank you, Father, that you have cared so much for us to allow us to see these things. Father, we would pray that these lessons not be wasted. We would pray, Father, that you would help each of us to dare to be a Daniel. And we do also pray, Father, we also pray that you would illuminate our horizon in the context of your word, that we might understand the times in which we live, that we might know what we need to do. We do pray, Father, that you would reignite in our own lives a sense of urgency for your kingdom. We do pray, Father, that you would just help each of us to continue to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that we each might be ever more fruitful stewards of the opportunities you put before us. Oh, Father, we just thank you for who you are. We just pray you would give us discernment for the days ahead as we commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation in the, names, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.